We're going to be reading from Matthew chapter 5, verse 43 through 48. As I give you a moment to to flip there, uh, from my wife and I, from Emily and I, we just want to thank the church. This past week, uh, we were able uh, to go and be at the Gospel Coalition National Conference, uh, where we were filled up and refreshed to come back into ministry. And the church affords that to us, and it's a wonderful thing for your pastor to just be poured into in that way, uh, and especially uh, Emily. So we thank you for that, church. We thank you for loving on us well, uh, refreshing us, and we're thankful that we have a strong leadership team and our elders uh, who can step in and preach uh, to give us the week off. So we're thankful for that as well. Let's read God's Word today. Matthew chapter 5, starting in verse 43, it says this. You've heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? You therefore must be perfect, as your heavenly Father is perfect. And all the glory for God's reading goes to him. Let's pray. God, we thank you so much that as we've already reflected in song today, God, that it is you and only you who does the work inside of us, that, God, you are the one that is powerful. God, we thank you that as we come to your word today, God, we can get a glimpse of our powerful God. As Sam brings your word to us today, God, I pray that our hearts would be stirred, that our hearts would be open and ready and distraction-free to receive uh, your word here today. God, let the truth of your word admonish us and encourage us for this life that's ahead of us. God, this difficult truth that we read here today, God, help us to apply it to our lives and to live, yet not I, but through you and you alone, for your glory, for your honor, and for your purposes. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. So here I am again, all right, so hopefully everybody's good with that. Um, All right, all right. So I just, as I was studying and preparing for this sermon, it's it's interesting to preach Jesus' sermon, okay? So that's that's what's happening at this point. Jesus has preached the sermon. I am re-preaching Jesus' sermon. And so as I study it and look at it, there are a million directions you can go with five verses from Jesus, okay? So the, I, I was just struck with it throughout this week, the, the wisdom, the sovereign reality of, of Jesus Christ. And, and just a couple sentences, I could, I could preach 16 different uh, sermons with 16 different points because it's so rich. And it struck me this week, and so to be totally transparent, I had at least three other sermons prepared before I put this one together, and I was like, okay, so I have to stick to loving your enemy because there's so much around that. And so this morning we're going to look at loving your enemy and the challenge and impossibility and difficulty that is for us. And so we wrap this section uh, of the Sermon on the Mount this week. If we look back starting at uh, verse 21, we go through anger and lust and divorce, oaths, retaliation, and eventually here get to love your enemy. And what we saw was the way that the scribes and the religious leaders were teaching uh, the law. Okay, so, so they were taking the, the law, they were interpreting it, and they were bringing their own truths out of it. And so, for the most part, as I looked at these, um, and, and we'll look at them quickly, it says, uh, and this is just brief synopsis here of it. So, uh, the scribe said, do not murder. Jesus said, do not even allow anger in your heart. 
We see do not commit adultery. Jesus said don't even allow wrongful lust in your heart. Jesus, or the scribes and, and uh, religious teachers said let divorce be done legally. And Jesus said do not divorce except sexual immorality. They said don't swear falsely. He said let your yes be yes and your no be no. Last week we saw that equal retribution is okay. Jesus said, go the extra mile for your adversary. So we see, we see the, the scribes' thoughts and teachings, and then we see what Jesus has to say. And so here we go even more extreme this week. When we look at what the scribes uh, taught, it's, it's not even close to what Jesus is going to tell us to do. And so honestly, if, if, if it was up to me, okay, we'll be transparent, the scribe's teaching makes sense, okay? And so a lot of things don't make sense when we look at what we are called to be as Christians. A lot of it doesn't come easy. A lot of it is not natural. We have to die daily, crucify the flesh, renew our minds, all of these things because it goes against what we want to do. And so it said, the, the scribes, the religious teachers said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Jesus is calling us to love our enemy and pray for him. And so these, these different teachings that the people were presented with created beliefs in their minds and in their hearts. And so this is, this is something that has really been, um, really since I've been coming to church, since I've been coming, or since I've been working over at the Erie City Mission, this concept, this thought that our beliefs determine our behavior is one of the strongest truths that I stand on apart from God's word. What we believe determines our behavior. And so, my, my analogy is always, when you guys, uh, you know, I always say it to the guys over at the mission, uh, I will say it now this morning. So to, to illustrate how our belief determines our behavior. When you guys came in this morning, everybody, you know, looked, where should I sit? Where do I usually sit? Is somebody in my spot? Yep, they are, so I'll sit somewhere else, okay? You walk up to the chair, and what did you do? You sat down in the chair, you didn't wonder, I wonder if this chair is going to hold me. I wonder if I should check, make sure all of the legs are good. We didn't get out the level and say, is it balanced? Am I going to fall off? No, you just believed that as you sat in the chair, it was going to hold you. And that type of belief in the promises of God's word would radically change our lives. It's available to us. All of the promises... All of the things Jesus tells us to do, he's not setting us up for failure. He's setting us up for an intimate relationship with himself. And oftentimes we're like, yeah, but that's impossible. And so we just accept things. And we settle. And we become complacent. And eventually it takes us places we never thought we would end up. And we say, how am I here? So some of us have to start asking us ourselves the question, what do I believe and why? Not the big questions. I believe a vast majority of us, okay, I will say that, understand that, that Jesus was God, that he came to earth, that he lived a perfect life, that he died on the cross, three days later he rose from the grave, and if we put our faith and trust in him, let him uh, uh, be the Lord of our life, that we are saved. I believe that, vast majority believes that. If you're not there, I hope you make that decision today. But on the average, everyday choices, you are not stuck. You can, you can choose, but you have to believe that that's available. I already said it, but I'm convinced that our beliefs determine our behavior and challenged recently with this study, I believe that our feelings follow our behavior. If you feel frustrated right now, if you are discouraged, if 
you are unhappy, if you are pessimistic about life, I would challenge you and say, what have you been doing throughout this week? I would say, have you been in God's word? Have you been intentionally surrendered? Or are you sneaking around doing something you should not be doing? Are you not being honest about the personal struggles that you have? Do you not have accountability in that area that you know you should have accountability in, but you just don't want to be honest with, with, with another person? Because if we exist like that, we are going to feel bad. And then we're going to do things we wish we did not do. Our feelings will follow our behavior. When we are lazy or indifferent about articulating our beliefs, we open the door for behavior that will negatively affect our feelings. And as humans, if we feel bad, we act bad. So jumping over to this passage today, the seeing the importance of our beliefs. If we are holding on to false beliefs, we are going to do things that we should not do. Jesus wraps up these antitheses, antitheses, okay, in this passage with this final one, to love your enemy and pray for those who persecute you. In this passage, Jesus explains how to love our enemies and why we should. In verse 43, we see the error in their beliefs. It says, you have heard that it was said you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Again, to me, that makes sense. Okay? What is, what is our enemy? What does it say? What, what is the definition? It says that the enemy is our foe. Anyone who harasses or causes problems for us. We can, we can think of people who fall into that category. But here Jesus, radical, okay, uh, challenges these people. That the religious people, the religious leaders were putting people into two categories. They were putting them into our neighbor and our enemy, our friend and our foe. You shall love your friend and hate your foe. This is as human as you can get. It just makes sense. It's almost not worth saying. Romans 12, 2 says, do not conform to the pattern of this world. This is worldly. This is loving my neighbor, hating my enemy. We get that. That's how we exist apart from a relationship with Jesus Christ. That is how the world treats people. Is that how we treat people? The religious leaders removed this giant part of this command. As yourself is left out of the commandment here. Leviticus 19.18 says, You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Charles Quarles points out, This subtle revision transformed a command about how God's people are to love into a command on whom they are to love. In the parable of the Good Samaritan, Jesus hammers home this point. And I just want to read it because this is something that continually came up in his interactions with people. This who is my neighbor reality. And so I'm going to cherry pick a little bit. It says in Luke chapter 10, you can look it up on your own. It's not on the screen. I'm just reading it quickly. It says, and behold, a lawyer stood up to put him to the test. So here is Jesus being put to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he said to them, What is written in the law? How do you read it? Jesus is asking, What do you believe? Okay, we're back to the belief thing. And he answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to the, and, and Jesus said to him, you have answered correctly, do this and you will live. But he, the lawyer desire, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, who is my neighbor? 
And we're back to this question. Who is my neighbor? They do not like this idea that just everyone is your neighbor. The scribes, the Pharisees have been trying to pick this apart since Moses got the law. And he says, who is my neighbor? And he goes through the story. The priest, the Levite, passing on the other side. The Samaritan comes, sees the man, sees that he needs help, goes over, gives his time, touches his wounds, mends them up, takes them to the end, pays money, invests in this person that would not have done it for him. And he tells the innkeeper, I'll be back, do whatever you need to, to keep him well. And Jesus says to him, which of these three do you think proved to be, I'm sorry, proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? And the lawyer said, the one who showed mercy on him. And Jesus said to him, you go and do likewise. So we see this error in their belief that, that there are neighbors and there are enemies. And so this is what Jesus is, is, is focusing on here in this part. And he says, no, I, I need to correct that belief. We need to correct our beliefs. Jesus is correcting this belief here by saying in verse 44, but I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. This is not talking about feelings. This is talking about action. That's what the Good Samaritan shows us. That, that we didn't kind of stop and check and say, hey, are you okay? And say a prayer for them and then kind of keep moving. All right? The priest and Levi didn't even do that. They just saw them and rocked around. But the Samaritan actually took time. Got his hands dirty. Got involved. It cost him something. This is what love looks like. Love is to have preference for, to wish well, to regard the welfare of, to be full of goodwill, and exhibit the same. The expectation from Jesus here we see is to treat people as if there were no categories at all. There's not friend, there's not foe, there's just people. Is that you? Do you love across the board? Is that me? Do I love across the board? It's a hard ask. Some of the hurts that, that, that we exist with, some of the things that people have done to us, some of the things that we continue to live with, do we have preference for? Do we wish well? Are we full of goodwill and exhibit the same? Galatians 5.22 says, familiar verse, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. And these that I have highlighted are patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness. Those are the things that I strive for in my life. Patience and gentleness are on the top of my list currently in my life that I am pursuing. Because it's, it's hard raising a five and six year old, all right? I know some of you guys are like, it's only two of them, all right? We got more than that, all right? But to be patient, to be gentle, to be kind, 100% of the time, even when I'm watching a football game and the children want to, uh, I don't know, watch anything except that, and now they're fighting, even though I gave them that show on the TV, I'm not watching football, and then I go down and spaghetti is just all over the carpet, okay? And in that moment, it's really hard for me. Full transparency. Are we that way with the, the big ones? That's simple. That's small. But where do we exist in our thinking? Do we display God? This is the question that keep coming up, kept coming up 
as I studied this passage, do I display God to my enemies, to people, to the people I love the most, as I started putting them all into the same category? Do I display God? So we see the error in their belief. We see Jesus correcting the belief in verse 44. Also here at the end of verse 44, we see the instruction to change their belief. Here is is the um, tool for change, and my personal belief is that it's the tool for change for everything. Okay? That's my belief. Here it is. The answer to all of your problems. Okay? It says, pray for those who persecute you. This is trouble or harass. We have several examples in the Bible of extreme persecution and people who in turn prayed for their persecutors. First one that comes to mind, Luke 23, 34, and Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. If we would see our sin like that, we would see our shortcomings, our frustrations, our, our impatience. My, my wife calls it hawking when I get mad. Our hawking as what nailed Jesus Christ to the cross. I, I just, maybe it's just me. Maybe I am the only one who is flipping in my choices, not taking my temperature of of am I getting more frustrated than I should be? Do I care for that person in the way that I should? Or am I just kind of really frustrated with them? I'm just going to let them do their own thing. Doesn't matter anyway. That brokenness that's inside of us that causes us to think this way. How do we address that? What is our uh, attack plan? Here we see Jesus forgiving us. I mean, I hope on a weekly basis you guys have, you guys think of the the creator of the universe dying on the cross. I hope that's never far from your mind. Okay, that happened. The pain, the shame, the embarrassment to be stripped naked and hung on a cross. God did that for us. And I get mad about spaghetti. Acts 7, 59 and 60, we see another example of praying for your persecutors. These are big examples. This is kind of the, uh, there is no temptation taking you, but such as is common to man. God is faithful. He'll make a way of escape. Okay, so when we are being harassed by people, it is possible in that moment to pray for our persecutors because we have examples in God's word. Here in Acts it says, and as they were stoning Stephen, brutal, killing him with rocks, I think sometimes we hear these stories and we don't really think about what's going on. He's about to die by being, having rocks thrown at him. Stephen called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And falling to his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Last thing, last thing he said was a prayer for the people who were doing it to him. That's convicting. That's radical. This takes discipline and a heart that is totally surrendered to Jesus Christ. This is not something (laughs) we try to do. This is what surrender looks like. This This is what it looks like to have the correct perspective on life. So who is it you need to start praying for? (laughs) So throughout this last week, maybe, maybe last, maybe two weeks ago, 
I was coming home from work, frustrated with some individuals in my circle, generically. And I was telling Brittany, and I get into this sermon this week, and I'm, I'm studying that I should be praying for those people who trouble or harass me. It doesn't say complain to your wife about them. And I was super convicted, and then I started praying for these individuals. And that's what God's word does. I hope you are experiencing that in your life, not relying on somebody like me to preach to you, encourage you, and then go do it. That's good if you do that. But on your own, studying God's word, seeing a truth, having sin revealed in your life, and then we change. And that's what the Holy Spirit does through his word. I love that I, sinner such as I, chief of all sinners, gets to experience that in life. That God's word does something to my heart, and I start to adjust. And so our instruction to change is prayer. <laughs> Pray for your enemy. If you are struggling with somebody or something, a situation, a difficulty, pray. Don't stop praying. We all understand that in this life we're going to have struggle, we're going to have heartbreak, difficult times, and sometimes it seems like prayer is not doing anything. But it's what we got. And God wants us to be totally dependent on him, bringing our problems and our situations and our struggles to him. Pray. I'm guilty of not praying enough. Number four, the reason for change, verse 45. It says, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. Matthew 5, 9 says, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. Ephesians 5, 1, therefore be imitators of God as beloved children. This reality, if we are in Christ, we are the sons, the children of God. The reason to change, this is not the how, this is the why. Here also we go back to our beliefs. Do we believe that a relationship with Jesus Christ has given us what is necessary to set us free? To set us free from uh, holding on to and, and being frustrated, being discouraged by another person? To the ability to pray for them? Do we believe that we have that power within us. The power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead surely can give us the power to pray for people who harass and trouble us. We have an example of it in God's word. It says, so that you may be sons of, uh, of your Father in heaven. It reads, because you are sons of your Father in heaven. Again, it's a big call, all right? I, I like to joke with Jack and, and tell him, you're a Meyer, all right? It matters. You gotta, you gotta listen. We're gonna do well. We're gonna score four goals today, all right? You're a Meyer. Even more so, we are sons of our Father in heaven. The question came up to me again, do I display the glory of God. Over and over. So because we are sons of our Father in heaven, number five, the comparison between God and man. Long section here, it says, for he makes his son rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? So here we see kind of two types of interactions. We see how God interacts with, interacts with mankind. 
He causes the sun to rise on the evil and the good, and he sends rain on the just and the unjust. Here, here, is, here is the verse that I go to when I see evil prosper. God's just good to us to give us air to breathe, to give us sunshine to enjoy. All of the good things come from our Father in heaven. And because he is so good, even the evil, even the unjust get to experience that. In both cases, we see the goodness of God pouring out on all people. God does not exempt certain people from experiencing him, at least the opportunity to. For God so loved the world. And he gives us all the opportunity. The way we interact with people, we love those who love us. Okay? Here Jesus compares them to the tax collectors. He says tax collectors and it kind of puts a bad taste in their mouth. Nobody likes the tax collectors. But we have a tendency to do that. We just love people who love us. It's nice, too. It's good. It's easy. I love being around people who are easy to be around. All right? So it's not necessarily a bad thing. But is that all we do? We greet only our brothers, the Gentiles, people who are not the Jews. This comparison that Jesus makes, we go for the easy way out. It's a fact, especially relationally. I don't want to trust that person. They hurt me. They burnt me. It's too difficult. I'm not doing it. I'm going to do what's easy. My desire is for us as a church body, and this is a little bit off topic, to know each other, to come home every Sunday morning, to be encouraged, to be open, to be honest about our struggles, our successes, to celebrate and to cry together. I don't know about you, but I need that in my life. And if we could all do it for everyone, how great would it be? I don't think that you have things figured out. Okay? Please don't think that I have things figured out. I fail all of the time because it's easy to do it our way. It's hard to do it Jesus' way. But the way God does it and the way we do it is radically different. Number six, the goal for changing our beliefs. Verse 48, therefore, you therefore must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. We need to approach others the way Jesus did, the way God does. Graciously, patiently, humbly, desiring peace and reconciliation. This is the goal of the Christian life, to grow little by little, day by day, to look more like Jesus, bringing all glory to God. And so this was the belief that Jesus was exposing in these teachers, this Love your neighbor and hate your enemy. And so quickly, uh, this, this was just on my heart throughout this week, throughout really since we've been studying these passages about these false teachings and the false beliefs that false teachings are going to create in our lives. And so uh, how do we change false beliefs and why? How do we do it? Number one, identify the false beliefs. Just, just several that I thought of. That's just the way I am. People can't totally change. It's not hurting anyone. I'm too bad. It's too late. It doesn't matter anyway. Okay? All lies that we tell ourselves. And we exist there. And we refuse to change. What does God's word say about it? Number two, identify the false belief. What does God's word say about it? 2 Peter 1, 3 and 4 says, His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. By which he's granted to us these great and precious promises so that through, so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. We have escaped it. 
He's given us everything we need for life and godliness. Everything to know God and to, to flesh that out on this earth to display him. So identify our false beliefs. What does God's word say about it? Whatever it is, we can do it. We can overcome it. Believe that. We have to believe that. Number three, believe change is possible. One of my favorite verses in the Bible, because it, it brings God into the choices that I make. Colossians 2, 6. Therefore, as you received Christ, Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. It's a head scratcher until you experience it. Just trust God that he is going to give you the ability, the power, the grace to get through whatever you're going through. Just believe it. Surrender. Trust. Obey. Because that's how we're supposed to do it. As we received Christ, so walk in him. Philippians 1, 6, I'm sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of, uh, of Jesus Christ. So identify our false belief. What does God's word say about it? Believe change is possible. Number four, experience God's transforming power. Psalms 34, 8, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. I hope, I hope that you have tasted and seen that the Lord is good. I hope it's not dull. I hope it's not difficult and hard to follow Jesus. He is the answer to all of our problems. Taste and see that the Lord is good. James 4, 8, it says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Are we drawing near to God? We need to experience this transforming power. And number five, encourage others with your experience. So we go back here to the loving your enemies, praying for them. Whoever God brings into your world, this verse right here, uh, 2 Corinthians 1, 3 through 5, these verses should be one of the ways in which we interact with people. It is why God, I don't want to say it definitively, it is one of the reasons God allows bad things to happen in our worlds. Sanctification for sure. And then this verse, it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our affliction, so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction, with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. So much comfort in that verse. Listen, people need to be encouraged. People need to be comforted. Even your enemies. Especially your enemies. I was challenged and convicted this week thinking, who else is being intentional to pour into this person? They are negative, they are difficult, they are struggling to do what they're supposed to do, and they are beat down by this world. If this is the interaction that they have with everybody, who is loving on them? It's hard to love on difficult people. It's tiring. It's annoying. And we are called to do that. And here we comfort them with the comfort that we've been comforted with all of our life experiences. God has been creating in you the opportunity to minister to a specific person or to specific people. Make sure we're praying about that. Even the difficult people who trouble and harass because we all need encouraged. And so as we recognize, identify those people in our worlds, my prayer is that we pray for them, that we love them, that we display the glory of God. Let's pray. God, we're grateful for your word, for, for the truth we find in it. God, even the impossible task that you give us to, to love our enemies, to pray for them, 
God, we need radical heart change in order to do that, in order to accomplish it. So I ask that you, in this moment, radically change our hearts. God, that you encourage us, give us the desire, the power to love the unlovely. Because that is what you did for us. We love you and thank you for it all. In Jesus' name, amen. Church, we have one of the greatest ways to respond to that message today in the celebration of communion. And as Sam has expounded for us today, um, Christ's teaching on unconditional love. Christ calls us not to, to love because, well, they love me back or because they do something for me. I scratch their back, they scratch mine. He says we're called to unconditional love. And we have the greatest opportunity to celebrate the greatest unconditional love that was shown towards us in Jesus on the cross. See, Jesus says here in the Sermon on the Mount, he says, love your enemies. But that wasn't just an empty command for Jesus for us to love our enemies. No, 22 chapters later, he demonstrated that for us. That he went to the cross, and on the cross, he loved me, an enemy. On the cross, he loved you, an enemy. On the cross, he loved the whole entire world who was at enmity with him because we were dead in the trespasses of our sin. Our sin has made us enemies of God. But Jesus still went to the cross for us. Jesus did exactly what he's calling us to do in the Sermon on the Mount, and he empowers that in us. So as we prepare to celebrate communion, the band's going to play. And, and, and what we want this to be is, as the band plays, um, I, I want to guide this time for you. This is a time to prepare and ready your hearts and your minds to worship God in communion. This is not a small thing that we celebrate. It's not a light thing that we do once a month, but it is a radical celebration of radical change that's taken place in our life. In 1 Corinthians 11, verse 27, it talks about the eating and the drinking of the bread in communion. It says this, Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. What he's saying is that it's serious. So Paul encourages us this way in verse 28. He says, let a person examine himself then. And so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. Let us examine our hearts. Let us examine our minds as we go to worship today. I want to remind you as well that our table, our communion table is open to all believers. If you uh, have surrendered your life to Jesus and he is the Lord and Savior of your life, then then we invite you to participate and celebrate this unconditional love. But if that's not you, then we just ask that maybe today you just pass on taking uh, this, this very serious element of our church. But if that is you, I'll ask you this question. Uh, I'll ask you this question that, that what's holding you back from experiencing God's great love for you? What's holding you back from experiencing the unconditional love that Sam just talked about the love that, that goes from God to you as, as an enemy, what's, ex, what's holding you back from experiencing that? I just want to let you know that we would love to tell you how you can experience that today. So as the band plays this song, let us remind ourselves of the greatness of communion, of the greatness of that unconditional love, and prepare our hearts and minds to take communion today. The dark is overwhelming and the brightest lights grow dim. Though the word of God is trampled on by foolish men. Though the wicked never stumble and abound in every place, we will
we will see, we will know uh, when we see his face. Communion is a foreshadowing of what life will be like forever as we commune with Christ in heaven. So if you have your cup and your bread there, we'll read scripture and we'll celebrate God's love for us today. 1 Corinthians 11, verse 23, it says this, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord on the night when he was betrayed took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do in remembrance of me. If you open your cups, a passage goes on and says, In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And the last verse there says, For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death and his unconditional love until he comes. Let's pray. Dearly Father, as we come before you now, we thank you so much that God, that you've chosen to love us, that you have shown us unconditional love, that you have allowed your love to fall upon us even though we are so undeserving. God, I pray that as recipients of that great love, that God, we would in turn show that love to a world that would seek to make enemies out of everyone. God, let us love the difficult. Let us love the hard. Let us love the, the people that would offer us nothing in return. And in so doing, let us exemplify your great love for us. God, we are a people marked by love. So God, let us love you. Let us love others. And let us make disciples in all of these things. God, we love you. We thank you for this day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Before we send you out here, just a quick reminder that we have membership classes that are going to be available October 21st and 28th. Those are Saturdays. Uh, they're a great way to just peel back the curtain and see what happens here at MCC, how you can become a member, how you can go deeper in your time here at MCC. So we'd encourage you to take advantage of those. And then also... If you are a member, uh, we have a very special membership meeting uh, Sunday, October 15th in the evening. Uh, we'll have some light refreshments back there. Uh, we're going to have a, a, a great meeting uh, just talking about the future, where God's leading us, uh, some different things that are, the doors that are being opened, some outreaches that are going to be happening. It's going to be a very encouraging membership meeting. So we'd encourage all of our members to attend that, to be a part of it. Uh, you can bring your kids, that's fine. Uh, it's going to be a great time for them to see just how the church works and how it functions as members. So uh, we invite you to both of those. But as we send you out, uh, let's go love others, let's love God, and let's make disciples because we are a sent people. You're dismissed.